Crossing Nation, Happy Easter! Man, it's so good to be with each and every single one of you. My name is Clayton Hensel, and for those of you who uh, don't know me, I have the opportunity to be one of the pastors here on staff at The Crossing. And my parents raised me in a good Christian home. They took me to church on a regular basis. But over time, I realized that there were some questions that I had that I didn't have really good answers to. Questions like, can I actually trust the Bible? Questions like, did Jesus really die on a cross? Questions like, if Jesus really died on a cross, was put in a grave on Friday, and then somehow on Sunday came back to life, how did that happen? I had questions and I needed some answers because I'd also heard some teachings about Jesus, that there was an eternal glory of heaven for those who were in a relationship with him, and then there was eternal punishment in hell for those who didn't. And when you think about eternity, and you think about the glories of heaven or the horrors of hell, uh, I figured I probably need to get this thing figured out because there's an awful lot that hangs in the balance. I had heard teachings about Jesus, teachings that I loved that were very appealing to me, teachings like forgiveness, peace, hope, but was it reliable? Was it trustworthy? I'd heard about all the love that Jesus proclaimed and the standard of love that he called his followers to. That also was appealing to me. But was it reliable? Was it trustworthy? And so I went on a search for answers to these questions. And this journey took me down one of the most life-changing roads. It changed my identity, it changed my purpose, and it changed my outlook on this life and in the life that is to come. So today, at The Crossing, we are beginning a seven-week sermon series called If, because we all have questions, and I think we all deserve some answers. It is designed to help people who already have a relationship with Jesus Christ to strengthen theirs, to give you a firmer foundation but it's also designed for those of you who have lost your faith, to those of you who are seeking your faith, for you to be able to find it, for you to be able to start it. I wanna welcome those of you joining in all of our different locations, those of you here at 48th Street, those of you who are part of our Macomb location, Kirksville and 929 and Pike County and Hannibal, those of you joining us in Lima, Mount Sterling, Keokuk, Monmouth, Jacksonville, to those of you who are part of our inside family at the Western Illinois Correctional Center, Pike County Jail, Adams County Jail, and those of you gathering at the Vandalia Women's Prison and the thousands of you joining online. And I, all, yeah, that's great. I also, I want to welcome all of you joining us for the very first time, or maybe the first time in a long time. We are so thankful that you are here. And I want you to know that there are campus pastors at every single one of our locations, and staff at every single one of our locations, and difference makers at every single one of our locations that are rooting for you and have been praying for you. As a church, we are in your corner, and we want to help you find an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know in a room this big at all of our different locations, there are some of you here today that are just here to make somebody else happy. We get it. So we're gonna get you out of here as soon as possible. We know that there are some of you gathering here today that don't believe in God. And I want you to know, you picked one of the coolest places to hang out if you don't believe in God. There are some of you here today, you believe in God, you're just mad at him. And I want you to know it's okay to be here if you're mad at God too. There are some of you who you are going through the thrills of life and you think you don't need God. And there are some of you who are going through the lows of life and you can't seem to find him. There are some of you who you have questions that you desperately need answered. And there are some of you listening to my voice right now that have questions you're too afraid to ask. For the first 18 years of my spiritual journey, this is what I thought it meant to be a Christian. It meant to close your eyes, cover your ears, ignore all human thought, all human reason, and just take a blind leap of faith. And I couldn't do it. I needed something that could be evaluated, something that could be examined, something that could be questioned. 
I was in a conversation with a guy, and he was telling me what God was like. And he was saying, you know, God's whoever you want him to be, man. There's no heaven. There's no hell. It doesn't matter what you do here on earth. It's all going to turn out well in the end. And so I listened for a while, and then I said, well, how do you know? And he was like, you just know, man. <laughs> okay, I'm exaggerating a little, but that's pretty much what he was. Pro- now, uh, we all have a little bit of that. I said, well, how do you know? He goes, I just know in my heart. Okay, I mean, that sounds cool. it make a good card. But, like, if you needed open heart surgery, and you had a friend who's like, just come on over to the house. I'll figure it out. I know how to do heart surgeries. And you said, well, how do you know? And they said to you, well, I just know how to do heart surgeries in my heart. You're going, no, I need something on a wall. I need something better than that. What I want to tell you is when it comes to eternity, when it comes to your salvation, when it comes to your soul, that is infinitely more important than open heart surgery. And I think we need something a little bit more than I just know in my heart. One of the commands of Jesus is to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. What I'm trying to tell you is, one of the ways we can love God is through a reasoned faith, not a blind one. Now listen to me, I don't want you to get me wrong. An intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ is definitely more than just intellectual assent. It's way more than just deep, critical thinking. But it is certainly not anything less. And today, I wanna take you on the journey that end up being life-giving to me and hopefully will help you on your faith journey. Uh, Here's the bottom line. The centerpiece of Christianity is not Jesus on the cross. I know some of you are like, oh my goodness, I knew that this church was crazy, and here it is on Easter weekend. But listen to me, it's just not, lots of people died on crosses. In fact, Jesus was only one third of the dudes who died on a cross on the day that became known as Good Friday. For all the Christian bumper stickers, for all the crosses on churches, for all the really cool cross tattoos, it's not the cross that makes a special. It's something different. Christianity rises and falls on a historical, factual, literal resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, one of the biggest names in all of Christianity, 20 years after this event, writes to a group of people in Corinth, and this is what he says. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, We are of all people most to be pitied. If the resurrection isn't true, we could all get an awful lot of our time back. And we could spend it way differently than we spend it. We would have different standards, different measurements. So I started this journey. And there are four historical facts that everybody has to agree on. Now, when I say everybody has to agree on these four facts, I'm just saying, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you have to agree on these four. Whether you are a a believe in God or you don't believe in God, atheist or agnostic, you can't get around these four historical facts. Historical fact, number one, Jesus of Nazareth died on a cross executed by Pontius Pilate. Now, this is not just the testimony of the Christian writers of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or, uh, you, or uh, Peter, or Paul. It's also of Josephus and Tacitus. Uh, Josephus was a Jewish historian. Tacitus was a Roman historian. And given the fact that both of these governments, both of these nations, were hostile to the person and message of Jesus, they included this stuff as a badge of honor. Yeah, this guy died. Nobody can dispute that there was a man by the name of Jesus who died on a cross executed by Pontius Pilate. The second historical fact is the grave was empty. We're gonna circle back on that one in a second. The third historical fact is that Jesus's early followers believed in a literal, physical, 
tangible, resurrected Jesus. And this event transformed their lives. This experience shifted who they were. They went from being fearful followers, discouraged and distraught followers, to being radical proclaimers of a gospel message and leaders of a movement that transformed society. They believed that Jesus rose from the grave. The fourth historical fact is that the Christian church was founded because of this belief in a risen Jesus. And these, this event was seismic. Here's what it did to the religious calendar. Uh, for 1,500 centuries, Jewish people who were trying to worship God, on Saturdays, they would worship him. But these early followers of Jesus who believed in a resurrection to honor and celebrate and commemorate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday shifted worship from Saturday to Sunday. Now that might not seem like that big of a deal, but I said 1,500 years of religious momentum. Imagine, what kind of event would have to happen today in our world, well actually not today, 1,250 years into the future where we no longer celebrated Independence Day on July 4th. We celebrated it on a different day. Who would have to occupy us? What would have to happen on our American soil that would make us as an entire nation go, hold on a second here, forget about independence from the Brits, We've got a whole different independence that we need to celebrate and we'd be letting off fireworks at some other time of the year. That was seismic. The second thing is, is it didn't just shift the religious calendar, it shifted every calendar. In fact, every event in human history and every event that will ever happen in the future is measured off of this event. Everything before Jesus is B.C., before Christ. Everything after is A.D., in the year of our Lord. We are gathered in 2023 in the year of our Lord, 20. 23. These four events, regardless of where you find yourself on the spiritual continuum, whether you hate God, barely believe in God, or been following God your whole life, all four of us have these four facts, or all of us have these four facts in common. Now, let's circle back to the empty tomb. It is a historical fact that the tomb was empty, and people have put forth a couple of theories as to how the grave was empty because it was empty. The first one is that everybody went to the wrong tomb. Now the problem with that is the first people that went to the tomb were women, and women pull over and ask for directions. <laughs> Had the first people been guys, we never would have found Jesus. We never would have known. He could have risen from the dead, but we never would have found out. But women will pull over. The second problem inside of this is we know whose tomb it was. It was Joseph of Arimathea's. It was a brand new tomb. He bought it, he had it made for himself. So he would have had to go to the wrong tomb. Not only that, the religious leaders would have had to have gone to the wrong tomb. And the Roman authorities who put a seal on it and put guards out in front to guard it would have had to go to the wrong tomb. In other words, the women went to the wrong tomb. The men went to the wrong tomb. The religious uh, authorities went to the wrong tomb. The civil authorities went to the wrong tomb. And Joseph of Arimathea, who bought it, forgot where he had it. Highly unlikely. Okay, well, the second theory is, uh, well, that Jesus didn't die. He swooned. Everybody say swoon. You'll never use that word again, but now we have it. <laughs> what they're saying is that Jesus just didn't die. Now, let me walk you through what he went through for just a quick second. First thing we find out is that he was beat. Then he was flogged, which has been known to kill people. Then he carried a heavy cross to the point of failure and Simon of Cyrene had to carry it the rest of the way. Then to help him recover from what he's already sustained, they drove nails in his feet and nails in his hands and strung him up on a cross for six hours to help him get a little bit better. Then the Roman officers, executioners, who were designed to make sure that people died, came up to him and said, he's dead. But just to make sure, they ran a spear up inside of him and pierced his heart. And it says that blood and water flowed out, which is pretty interesting 
because um, I, I don't know how many of you guys have ever stabbed somebody in the heart, but that's like one of the new policies we have here at the church, no stabbing. And if I were to stab you right now and you're living, just blood would come rushing out of your heart, okay? If I stabbed you, actually, let me put it over here. If I were to stab you, it, all that would happen. But if you are already dead, something happens when you die. Your blood separates. When you go to give blood, your doctor will tell you this, your blood will separate. The red blood cells will co collect at the bottom and your uh, plasma, which looks a little bit more like water, the clear substance will float to the top. It's like oil and water in a jar. So when you pierce it, what comes out first? What's at the bottom? The blood. And then what comes after that? The water. The only way you would get that is if Jesus was already dead before he was stabbed. But he survived that, I guess, and then all the blood drained out from at least this way down. Then, they, do, you know, they put him in a first century ICU, also known as a grave. And they put him in the grave and they wrap him up and then they put 75 pounds of spices in there. Then they, uh, it's cold and dark, they roll the, 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 the stone over the grave and then they just leave him in there for three days. No food, no water, no care. So he can just rest up. And then he rises up and he makes his clothes. That's why women love Jesus. Because when Jesus gets up, he folds his clothes, makes them, stacks them all neatly. Then from inside the tomb, he rolls the stone back, which is a pretty Herculean effort because when the women were going to the tomb, they said, who's gonna move this big stone for us? Well, Jesus, he's had a couple hours rest from everything that he's been going through, so he's more than willing to be able to move or more than able to move the stone. And then he goes out and takes out the Roman guards. That's what they're proposing in the swoon theory. I wasn't buying it. I'm guessing neither are you. Other people have said, uh, well, it was just a hallucination. Everybody was just hallucinating that Jesus had risen from the dead. The problem with that is uh, people who usually hallucinate have either done a lot of drugs or they have a severe mental illness. And rarely do people have the exact same hallucination. I mean, some of you, you know somebody who's had too much, and you were having too much too. And you probably didn't do the, are you seeing this too, man? Here's what would have had to happen. The women at the tomb, the disciples at the tomb, Thomas when he physically touched him, the two on the road to Emmaus, those who went fishing with Jesus, and over 500 people, would have all had to have the exact same hallucination over a period of 40 days. The other problem is it still doesn't account for the empty tomb. All they would have had to do is go, hey, you hallucinating uh, crazy people, here's dead Jesus. But they didn't do that. So then what they said is maybe, maybe someone stole Jesus. Okay, maybe his enemies did it. Well, that doesn't make sense. Why would Jesus' enemies steal his body because they were trying to kill this infant movement. They were trying to stop it before it got big. They were frustrated. If they had stolen the body, all they would have had to do is say, here is dead Jesus. And it would have been over. Well, maybe, maybe the disciples stole it. They believed so much in his message that they would have stolen his body to keep the, the myth and the rumor alive. The problem with that is that they would have had to overpower the guards and they were never brought to trial and punished for stealing the body. The other problem is their lives were completely transformed by this event. Almost all of them were committed to it to the point of death. There were zero defectors. Everybody who saw Jesus alive believed it and paid dearly for it. They were severely punished or killed for the belief that Jesus not only died for their sins, but rose from the grave in a bodily, physical, tangible state. People die all the time. People die for causes all the time. But people don't die for something that they know to be a lie. These early followers of Jesus would have had to have stolen the body and known in their hearts 
that Jesus did not rise from the dead and then spend the rest of their lives at great cost proclaiming and suffering for what they were proclaiming, that Jesus rose from the dead. They received no comfort for this belief, no social standing, no monetary gain. All they did was suffer for what they believed. And for me, I couldn't buy it. This left me with sufficient evidence to believe that Jesus indeed rose from the grave. And that means that Jesus is who he says he is. And that means that what he taught has value and implications for me. That I can look through an empty tomb and I can see the cross and I can see the teachings that he left for you and for me. That means that hell is real and so is heaven. And when I die, I need to have this figured out and have a life that reflects it. In my opinion, it means at least four things. A resurrected Jesus means one, that God loves you and will never stop loving you. He loved you before you ever took your first breath. He loved you before you ever did anything wrong. Because before you existed, he sent his son to die on the cross on your behalf. And you can tell how much somebody or how much something is worth by how much someone is willing to pay for it. Some of you right now, you may be experiencing uh, an increase in the appraisal of your home. And you're looking around and you're going, our house keeps going up in value. And some of you are excited about it because you're ready to sell. Others of you are frustrated by it because you know that the, assessor, uh, the, the county assessor is looking at the same thing that you're looking at. And you're like, we haven't done anything to our house, but the value keeps going up. Well, it's because your house value is going up because other people are willing to pay more for what you have. Your value is based on what somebody else was willing to pay for it. And if you wanna figure out how much you're worth, all you have to do is look at the cross because God sent his one and only son to die on the cross to rescue you, to purchase you, to redeem you, to buy you. And it cost him the life of his son. That's how much you're worth. The second thing that it means is that you have purpose because God created you. You are not an accident. Your parents might not have planned you. You might be the result of a lot of country music and a lot of alcohol on a really long night. But that does not mean that God did not want to bring you into the world. That means that God believes that you have something to offer and God has something to offer you. Three, it means that you can be made new. I wonder if there's anybody gathering at any of our locations who could use a do-over, who would like to be made new, who would like a restart, who would appreciate a mulligan. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not just that he changes us, but he makes you new. Point four, the fourth thing that a resurrected Jesus means is you have been completely forgiven. If I were right now to pass the microphone around and say, everybody tell us your darkest sin, I would walk off the stage and then all of you would go to the bathroom and that would be the end of our church, okay? Everybody would be doing burnouts in the parking lot. We gotta get out of here. Because there are certain sins that we would tell people that we wrestle with. And there are some sins we don't ever want anybody to find out. And Jesus paid for them all. Jesus came for all of it. Well, how does God make this happen? How does all of this take place? Second Corinthians chapter five tells us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, to be in Christ is to have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So these statements are true if you are in an intimate personal relationship with Christ. The new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. When you come into an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when you are in Christ, you are made new. If you are not in an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you are still in your sins. Let's keep going. 
All of this is from God. This wasn't our idea, this was his idea. He loved us so much that he came up with the idea to reconcile us to himself through Christ. So you get a right relationship with God. That reconciliation means a right relationship. He came up with it that it happens through Christ. It doesn't matter how many friends you have, it doesn't matter if your parents believed, it doesn't matter if you make enough money or how poor you are, it doesn't matter how connected you are, how cool your job is, how fashionable you are, how you look in the mirror, none of that matters. What matters is are you in Christ? Because it is through Christ that we are reconciled. And those of us who get reconciled, he gives us the ministry of reconciliation to go out and help other people find this relationship with God. Let's keep going in the text. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. How was he doing that? By this, by not counting people's sins against them. Every single one of us, our relational struggles with friends, family members, spouses, coworkers, bosses, has everything to do with the fact that they are counting our sins against us and we are counting their sins against them. But God chose not to count your sins against you. Well, how does he do that? We're gonna find out in a couple of verses. That God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them, and then he has committed to us, those of us who are in Christ, the message of reconciliation. Let's keep going. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Come into an intimate, personal relationship with him and experience the purpose and the forgiveness and the love that you were destined for, that you were created for. Well, how is God not counting our sins against us? How are we coming into this reconciled state with God? Verse, the next verse tells us. God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him, in Christ, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Here's what happened. God looked at you and took all of the sins that you have ever committed and all the sins that you will ever commit and he placed them on the perfect person of Jesus. And he took all of the perfection of Jesus and he placed it on us. And so he still punished the sins. He just didn't punish us. He punished the ones who bore our sins. And so when you and I look at an empty grave and we look at the cross, we see Jesus suffering on our behalf so that you and I could have a right relationship with God. Here's what I'm trying to say. If you are needing rescued, I know where to find it. If you're looking for mercy, I know where you can get it. If you need a restart, if you need to be made new, if you need someone to take care of your past and give you a future, I know where you can get it. If you're the kind of person who's needing to be made righteous, if you want the promise of heaven, if you're looking for hope, if you're needing some help, if you're looking for a miracle, if you want some comfort, some direction, or peace, I know where you can find it, but don't go to the tomb, because he's not there. And don't go to the cross, he's not there either. But it's because of an empty tomb and it's because of a cross that I can come into a relationship with a risen savior. He is alive and he wants a relationship with you. And the worst thing you could do is put it off. We're moving to a time of decision. There's some of you in here today, you've never started an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want you to hear me say this. For me, and for thousands of people all across this region, we would tell you two things. It was the greatest decision we ever made, and our biggest regret is we didn't do it sooner. And I know there's some of you in here going, Clayton, um, I still have a lot of questions, and I'm going to encourage you to ask them. Don't hide from them. Pray through them. But there is some of you in this room or watching online that you know enough. Now, here's what I mean. Um, most of you don't know everything there is to know about a car, but you know enough that you don't wanna walk. Some of you, you don't know everything there is to know about a house, 
but you signed all 56 legal documents that you didn't read when you bought one. And you walked away so proud of yourself. And I could have put in, you, your banker could have put in that contract, bring Clayton a Snickers every day for the rest of your life. I'm like, it's right there. I'm like, I didn't know it because I wasn't reading. So you didn't know everything, but you knew enough. Men, be cool here. How many of you know everything there is to know about a woman? Yeah, we have a support group that meets on Tuesdays. <laughs> and how many of you would say that what you knew about your wife last month no longer applies this month? <laughs> but you know enough to know that you wanted her in your life forever. I get the desire to know God and to understand everything about him. But I need you to know you will never understand everything about an infinite God with your finite brain. But you can know enough. You can know enough to know that you need him and you don't wanna spend another day of your life without him. And you can be made new today. You can be reconciled to God today. You can get your restart today. You can experience forgiveness today. You have to make a decision and no decision is a decision. And if you have questions about what that is or what that looks like, there's gonna be somebody right over there by the baptistry who would love an opportunity to talk with you about what that looks like. And to the rest of you, to the Christians, to those who've been made new, been forgiven, are loved, have been reconciled, God has given you and I a ministry of reconciliation. And why would you settle for living for anything less there is no grander purpose for your life, no better mission to submit yourself to, no greater message to display. And God is calling us to bring his lost children home. And will you join us in that mission? Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, do something in this church, in this service right now. Do something that only you can do. Stir hearts, change hearts, alter destinies, change eternal destinations. God, we believe that you can do it, and we're begging you to do so. In your name I pray, amen.